Hey guys, today we're looking at Leonardo da Vinci. We're doing it a little differently because you can't do Leonardo da Vinci without showing some of his works. So this is my makeshift movie theater. We'll see how it goes, right? So Leonardo da Vinci here, born in 1452. He's going to live 67 years. Uh, Leonardo was born uh, from, uh, to a couple that were not married. His father was a notary, which means that he made a little bit of money, but his mom was a peasant. So what this means is that Leonardo is not going to inherit anything. Um, when he, uh, he's going to be born in the town of Vinci, which is a, uh, a small town in the region of Florence, which is a very large city at the time. Okay, so uh, he, is, he does have 12 half-brothers and sisters, so he has a big family. He's just not, I mean, he, and he's the oldest. And we'll move on. Uh, when he, uh, when he was growing up, early, in his early, early years, he studied mathematics, specifically uh, arithmetic and geometry, and he studied a lot of uh, Latin. When he was 14, uh, he wrote down some, some uh, of his memories of when he was young. His earliest memory is when a kite, which is a type of bird, uh, flew down and landed on his crib. And he, remember, he remembers that. He also remembers exploring a cave and being afraid of uh, any monsters that might be in the cave, but he was actually more afraid of not knowing what was in the cave. And so this is going to be part of his, his lifestyle of choosing to go after knowledge. Uh, the family's going to move to, or well, his dad's going to move to uh, Florence when uh, Da Vinci is 14. And he's going to uh, set Leonardo up as a gopher, as an errand boy, to a reasonably famous artist named Verrocchio. So Verrocchio is going to have Leonardo uh, just do errands and, and wash out paint brushes and uh, go build fires and do all sorts of crazy stuff. When he's 17, uh, Le uh, Leonardo is uh, given the chance to become an apprentice. So an apprentice is somebody who works with the master, Verrocchio, and does bigger and better stuff, right, is a bigger and better errand boy. But the apprentice also is a person who learns what's going on and starts to put in some some work into the art projects that the master of Rocchio is assigned. So I have my list. Uh, let's see. Leonardo learned from Verrocchio. Uh, he learned drafting and chemistry. Uh, chemistry because you have to mix different things to make different colors. Metallurgy, metalworking, plaster casting, leatherworking, mechanics, and woodwork. And then obviously drawing, painting, sculpting, and modeling. Uh, Leonardo probably became famous here because of this picture, or this drawing, this painting by Verrocchio. So Verrocchio was given, uh, this is called the Baptism of Christ, and so we have John the Baptist and Jesus there. And we've got a couple of angels down here. Well. What happens on these big paintings is the master is, is given, is, is he paints most of it and then he gives his apprentices some small part to paint. And so Leonardo at the age of 17, 18 was given the chance to paint this angel down here. And so this angel um, has, is, according to the people who know, this angel is so much better drawn and painted than the entire rest of the painting that it's just embarrassing for Verrocchio. And the anecdotal story says Verrocchio uh, showed up one day and saw Leonardo's angel, just this small little angel over here, and he took his brush and he put it down and he never painted again because he was too embarrassed to paint when this little apprentice could do so much better than he could. So this is called the Baptism of the Christ. Uh, is this Leonardo's first painting? Well, no. There's a story that says that back when he was 10, Leonardo uh, was asked by his father to paint a round shield uh, that, a, that one of his father's friends had brought him. And so Leonardo, who was interested in uh, mythology, decided to paint Medusa, with all the snakes in her hair, Medusa on the shield. And apparently it was so lifelike that the guy who uh, wanted the shield painted he was like, no, 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 that's too crazy, I don't want to buy that. And so his dad sold it, he sold it to a person who then sold it to the Duke of Milan. So Leonardo, his name is, is going to start getting out there. In 1460, uh, in, 14, in 1472, uh, when 
Leonardo turned 20, he was acclaimed as a master of the arts, which means he could move out of Verrocchio's studio and start his own. So he is going to start his own, and he is going to have apprentices, but he's going to hang out with Verrocchio from time to time, simply because he wants to continue to work with what he thought was a, a master. Um, in 1476 and then in 78, 77, 78, uh, Leonardo was given several different projects to work on, um, some religious, some religious icon, uh, iconography uh, things. So we're talking about paintings of Jesus and or biblical images. Uh, here's one. This is called the Adoration of the Magi, and that was hard to see because, well, it's hard to see. He didn't finish it which is going to be a running theme through Leonardo's life, is he's going to start some really impressive things and then he's going to, he's going to get distracted, maybe ADHD or something, he's going to get distracted and say, ah, moving on, and, uh, and go work on something else and never come back and finish some of these things. So he's going to do this and Michelangelo is going to be famous for doing this as well. Let's see, so this is the Adoration of the Magi and he was going to, uh, the reason he stopped doing this was because he wanted to go work specifically for the Duke of Milan. And so he wrote a letter to the Duke and he said, um, Your Lordship, I am really good at the following things, including engineering, I can help build castles, and I can design war machines. And here's an example of a war machine. Oh, and I also paint. And accompanying this letter is a musical instrument that I made out of a ram's horn and uh, silver. So there you go. And so the Duke of Milan said, All right, man. I'm going to hire you. In, uh, let's see, from 1482 to 1499, so those 17 years, Leonardo is going to work for the Duke of Milan, and, and uh, during this time, he's going to produce some pretty famous pieces of art. This is the Virgin of uh, Virgin on the Rocks, and so there's the Virgin Mary and, and the kids, right? But arguably, you know, one of his more famous paintings, He's going to uh, paint this in uh, around 1485. This is called uh, The Last Supper. You may have heard of it. And so there's Jesus with his 12, uh, well, his gang. Um, and this is located at the, this is located, let me get this right, in Milan, the church of the Santa Maria della Grazia. Ooh, that sounded good. It's like I practiced that. Um, this painting has been restored and restored and restored because those of you who know a little art history, you know that Leonardo was experimenting with different types of paints. And so the paints that he used on this immediately started to fade and uh, it got pretty bad until some people came, came around and uh, kind of retouched it up. Yes, there's a door cut there where Jesus' feet is supposed to be, but uh, that's not Leonardo's fault. That's the Nazis' fault. Back there in World War II, they decided to cut a door in one of the most famous paintings in the world. <sighs> the Nazis. All right, moving on. In, 14, uh, in 1488, yeah, in 1488, Leo, Leonardo uh, was commissioned to design a giant bronze horse. And so he, he decided he was going to make this sucker, like, big, like, big, big. Uh, and so here, uh, here are some of his sketches, and he's going to work on this, and he's going to have various horse statues that he's going to work on, basically all the way up to the end of his life. But, ha, ah, they're never going to get made. They're never going to get made. This one wasn't made because uh, at the point that he was almost ready to cast it, that... Uh, well, Italy is going to be involved in 6,000 different civil wars and they're going to use that bronze to make cannonballs instead. Oh well. Uh, but the famous giant horse of Leonardo that did not get made. Uh, Leonardo is going to uh, go to Venice to escape the war and he's going to come back to uh, uh, Milan and Florence where he's going to hang out. Okay, so let's... This next one uh, it, this is called The Virgin and Child with St. Anne and St. John the Baptist. And he did this on eight sheets of paper, which are kind of glued together. And he did this just with charcoal and chalk, uh, perhaps thinking that, so there's charcoal and chalk, so it's, it's kind of hard to see. Right, and some, some people are thinking that maybe he was just kind of you know, cartooning it out, sketching it out so then he could put it up on a wall later, and he never did. Again, he moved on to the next thing. And so people 
uh, people come far and wide to come see uh, a charcoal and chalk drawing by Leonardo. In 1500, in 1500, he's going to paint this painting. This is the Salvador Mundi. So Mundi being world, Salvador being you know savior, savior of the world. So here's Jesus with his uh, with the orb of the world in his hand. This particular painting, just three years ago, in the year 2017, uh, was sold at the at Christie's auction over there in England for, I'm going to get my number right, $450 million, uh, which makes it the most expensive painting ever to be sold. Um, and there you go, the Salvador Mundi by Leonardo da Vinci, the most expensive painting to ever, ever be sold. Four hundred and fifty million dollars, and he did that in fifteen hundred. Hey, in fifteen o three, he's going to start painting this reasonably famous painting. So this is Elisa del Giacondo, and uh, her portrait, right? So he's going to start this in fifteen o three, and you know that that's a date set by different art historians. Some say he didn't start until fifteen o five. Some say he didn't start until fifteen twelve. Some say. He, it took him three years, some say it took him 15 years, so sometime around between 1513 and 1517, uh, this was finished to the point of where it's finished now. And so, uh, La Gioconda, we call her the Mona Lisa, and uh, she is, well, she is the most expensive painting in the world, right? She's, she's priceless which means you can't put any money on her with regard to how much she would sell for, but uh, insur for insurance purposes, she's listed at over half a billion dollars just for insurance purposes. She was, uh, she was stolen at the beginning of the 20th century in the early 1900s. She was stolen and the thieves felt so bad about it that they brought her back. So, the Mona Lisa, right? In 1505, uh, and all these art pieces, they, they overlap each other. In 1505, Leonardo is going to, uh, he's going to be commissioned to do the Battle of uh, Anagari in the Salone de Cinquecento, right? Uh, my Italian, ah, the Hall of 500. Uh, I would love to show you, uh, love to show you that drawing, but he never, he never do, did it. If I could go back in time and tell him to do this one, I, I I really want to because here's what's going on. He was supposed to draw, a, excuse me, paint this basically in a hallway, and on the other side of the hallway is the opposing force. So he's going to draw one side of the battle, and another artist, this unknown artist, right, is going to draw on the other side a, a different version of a different battle. And so that other artist was a young upstart, ne'er do well, Michelangelo. So Michelangelo actually sketched his on the wall, but then never came back and finished it either. <sighs> Can you imagine walking down a hallway and on one side you have a Leonardo da Vinci painting, on the other side you have a Michelangelo painting, and they're facing each other? <sighs> what could have been? But they moved on. All right, uh, let's see. In uh, Again, trying to avoid wars because Italy is constantly at wars. Uh, those of you who have read The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, you know what's going on at this point. Um, Leonardo finds himself in Rome, um, and he's going to be living in the Apostolic Palace, where, where the Pope lives, right? So uh, not, only, not only does he have a room there, but Michelangelo and Raphael also occasionally, uh, well, occasionally show up. So that's three of the four turtles, right? So where's Donatello? Well, Donatello uh, is actually much, uh, well, I don't say much, is earlier than these guys. Uh, Donatello is going to uh, die in 1466, so 50 years before Leonardo and the other two show up to the, to the uh, Vatican, uh, Donatello's already going to be dead. But three of the four turtles, they're at the same time. Uh, obviously, we're talking about the Mutant Ninja Turtles. There you go. I know you knew that stuff. Um, so he's going to do a lot of different works for the Pope, and including uh, he's going to continue to work, or he's going to try to, to make a new horse model, and he does build one out of wax. Uh, but that's as far as, they get, as he gets in. Uh, when 
who are we talking about? <laughs> Leonardo uh, turned 65. Um, people think that he had a stroke, and so uh, his right hand was paralyzed. Um, and it went downhill from there. Two years later, Leonardo was going to die at the age of 67. Leonardo, uh, his last words, according to historians, well, this is something, this is really something to think about. He says this, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Well, that, that tells you something about Leonardo, right? And so, he's going to pass away, and the world's going to mourn his loss. Some things that, uh, that were fortunate with regard to Leonardo is that he kept notebooks and notebooks and notebooks about anything and everything that he thought about and that he saw. And so he's going to draw and, and uh, write treatises on just about every single thing you can possibly imagine. So here we have the Vitruvian man talking about the different, the, the perfect proportions of the human body. And here we have, looks like a fetus and various stages of, of uh, birth. Uh, one, of the, one of the common, common uh, facts about Leonardo is that uh, he wrote backwards and so uh, it's very difficult for for me to read uh, Leonardo's uh, writing one because um, he wrote it backwards and two I don't read you know 15th century Italian but if you do read 15th century Italian and you read in cursive then uh, there you go jump on that so these images here are just uh, just pages copied from Leonardo's notebooks. Um, you, can, you can go to you know, a bookstore and pick up a very thick book called The Notebooks of Leonardo and just go through it and gosh, he wrote probably a million words talking about just things that he noticed about nature and how everything works. So here's uh, different, uh, well it looks like the arm, arm bones and here we have various anatomy pictures you know not just uh, not just anatomy although Leonardo was famous for going out and digging up corpses and uh, looking to see how things worked which is going to get him in trouble at some point and then Michelangelo does the same thing too but um, but not only anatomy and physiology but Leonardo is also going to be pretty famous for again his war stuff uh, and his designs he's going to design the parachute a version of the parachute he's going to design the tank there's a there's a kind of a version there, and he's going to be given credit for the helicopter, um, and so there you go. So the helicopter, let's see, the helicopter that came out what in the 19 you know what 1940s 1950s the helicopter, and he's doing it 500 years earlier. Woo! His war machines, pretty famous. He's got his. Uh, his giant crossbow and so here's a person that's a person standing there next to the lever the giant crossbow uh, and then his water wheels etc etc all right so uh, this is this is a, our, uh, possibly his last sketch no one's real for sure but this is and this is possibly a self portrait of Leonardo uh, looking himself in the mirror and drawing um, Okay, so I have, a, I have the list of things that, that uh, he's famous for. He was an inventor, a drawer, he a painter, a sculptor. He was an architect. Obviously, he's into science. He was into music, math, aerodynamics, hydrodynamics, war, engineering, literature, anatomy, physiology, geology, astronomy, botany, paleontology, and he drew some maps. Um, in fact, he drew, a, he drew a map that got him a job because uh, one of the dukes said, wait, that's my city? How did you get that? And Leonardo's like, I'm Leonardo. Um, and then ob obviously he's the painter, uh, the painter of the, the most famous painter in the world, La Gioconda, the Mona Lisa. Unfortunately for us, uh, only about 15 of his paintings still survive today, but uh, that's 15 
that uh, we get to see. So Leonardo um, is arguably the the closest to the definition of Renaissance man that we have. A Renaissance man is somebody who is uh, intellectually curious and goes after any scrap of you know curiosity, wants to fulfill that, wants to, to gain that knowledge. A Renaissance man, uh, somebody who lived in the Renaissance who did this, today we don't use that necessarily, we use the word polymath. Uh, poly meaning lots and math is kind of, well math, but polymath, somebody who knows a lot about a lot. You know, we, there's a lot of us who know a whole bunch about a, no wait, a whole bunch about a little or a little bit about a whole bunch. But if you know a whole bunch about a whole bunch, then you're a polymath, you're a Renaissance man. And this guy, he is the ultimate Renaissance man. All right, so that's Leonardo da Vinci. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Feel free to look him up. Go to any of the websites, type in Leonardo da Vinci biography, and wow, there's a ton of stuff out there that I, I didn't even begin to talk about. All right, guys, stay safe. Be good. See you on the flip side.